I'm starting. So. And then you want Just your, go ahead, Jason. Just start right now. Let's get her going. Cool. Sounds good. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to beautiful Fish Creek Park. Sorry we're running a little bit late. I am uh, Jason Nixon, of course, the Minister of Environment and Parks in our great province, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you for an exciting announcement from Premier Kenny today. First, though, I would like to take a moment and thank the friends of Fish Creek Park Provincial Park Society for hosting us at their beautiful historical site today. I want to also take a moment to welcome my Calgary Caucus colleagues who are here, including the MLA for Fish Creek, Richard Godfrey, whose constituency we are presently in, as well as Minister Schultz, Rebecca Schultz, Minister Jason Copping, and MLA's Whitney Isaac, Tanny Furr, and Devinder Tor. And I want to also take a quick moment and recognize Sue Comfort and Dale Marshall uh, from the Friends of the Eastern Slopes, another great partner organization with Alberta Environment and Parks, who are all the way down here from my neck of the woods in Sundry. Welcome to Calgary. Operators, educators, ambassadors, and other partners make so many positive experiences possible within our provincial parks and on our province's public lands. Many Albertans who enjoy facilities made possible by these partners do not even realize that they are doing so. To all of our partners, Alberta's government sincerely appreciates your strong commitment to stewardship, education, and the provisions of services to Albertans who love our wild places. Today is a great day to celebrate and build on these important relationships. In a moment, we will hear from two of these important partners. Nick Bunshot, the Executive Director of the Friends of Fish Creek, and Sarah Parker, the Executive Director of Glembo Ranch Park Foundation. But first, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you Premier Jason Kenney, who has some very exciting news to share today. Well, thank you so much uh, to Big Jason. Uh, and it is great to be back in Calgary's backyard, Fish Creek Park, one of my favorite places uh, anywhere on earth. Uh, I used to live pretty close to the park and spent many um, many happy days uh, visiting this, one of the largest urban parks in Canada, uh, which is deep in, uh, in, rich in our history uh, and a fantastic preservation of our natural environment. Thanks to all of the uh, MLAs and uh, ministers who are with us, uh, particularly in the constituency of, of Calgary Fish Creek, Richard Gottfried, uh, who is a passionate advocate uh, for Fish Creek Park for a very exciting announcement about uh, strengthening Alberta's provincial parks while creating jobs as part of our economic recovery strategy. Uh, as I say, Fish Creek uh, is Calgary's backyard. It's one of the biggest natural environment parks on the continent with more than 1,300 hectares of prairie, spruce forest, wetlands, and waterways. This is especially true for folks uh, in my riding next door in Calgary Lougheed Although, as I say, uh, MLA Godfrey may have a greater claim to, uh, uh, to this fantastic uh, public space. Fish Creek Park is a marvelous example of how these spaces thrive. For Calgarians across our city, especially down here uh, in the Deep South, this has always been a special place that has brought our community together. Fish Creek is home to a rich ar array of wildlife, and sensitive historical sites recording thousands of years of human presence from the First Nations to the first Europeans, uh, the Glen family who arrived uh, in this valley in 1873. The park gets two to three million uh, annual visits and has over a hundred kilometers of pathways along with educational facilities, roads and utilities. That's why today is such a great day Parks like this have drawn people to our province, bringing them in as guests uh, and convincing them to stay as Albertans. Our natural beauty is unmatched, and our provincial parks, like Fish Creek, show off some of the best that we have to offer. If this year, this really tough and different year, has taught us anything, it's how lucky we are to have such a beautiful natural environment to explore, uh, even when the rest of the world has shut their doors due to the pandemic. In the age of physical distancing, outdoor recreation has quickly become one of the most popular and one of the safest ways to have fun. 
In fact, use of parks and public lands has surged over this past summer. That is why I am thrilled to announce that Alberta taxpayers are investing more than $43 million in our parks to improve trails, upgrade campgrounds, enhance day-use facilities, and other infrastructure to help folks enjoy our parks while protecting Alberta's environment. Here in Fish Creek, that means upgrades to improve trails, parking, washrooms and shelters, and a replacement of the fence at Shannon Terrace. This is all part of a $4.5 million Al uh, Alberta government investment uh, in the Calgary area alone to keep our provincial parks beautiful for years to come while creating jobs now when they're needed most. Altogether, these projects across our province will help get to nearly 300 Albertans back to work. Alberta's government is dedicated to protecting parks and the people and businesses that depend on them. They support jobs, growth, and opportunities in industries like tourism, hospitality, and services, meaning they're also a key part of Alberta's economy. The need to diversify our economy is more important than ever. Because Alberta's been hit hard by the triple whammy of the largest uh, pandemic in a century, the largest, largest global economic collapse in a century, and the largest collapse in energy prices in history. Our solution is Alberta's recovery plan, a bold, ambitious strategy to build, to diversify, and to create tens of thousands of jobs now. And we're moving fast with announcements like this one to put that plan into effect. In the short term, we're investing in projects to get Albertans working now, building infrastructure that will support our economy and prosperity long into the future. But it's not just the government that looks after these amazing parks. I am truly grateful to the volunteer organizations like the Friends of Fish Creek uh, Park, uh, Provincial Park Society uh, who are out there every day maintaining, monitoring the, the, the landscapes and improving these parks and the visitor experience. What you have accomplished here in the heart of our largest city points to how important your work is. In fact, a number of partners like this help to identify the need for the improvements we're announcing today, and they'll be essential to helping to get the work done. They bring valuable experience to the tasks of reaching out to visitors, educating them about responsible recreation and preserving ecosystems. Uh, this kind of public service and public spirited devotion to the community deserves public support. And so I am also pleased to announce today that in addition to the uh, job creating capital funding, uh, we are also announcing a program to our grant, a program grant to our hosts, the Friends of Fr Fish Creek Provincial Park Society. Nick and his team will receive almost half a million dollars over three years to enhance the tremendous work they're doing on conservation, ecology, and visitor information. They've been trusted partners of Alberta's government for the past 27 years. The beauty all around us speaks uh, eloquently to their devotion uh, to, to this uh, provincial park. And we're strengthening our relationship with the society to allow them to have an even bigger positive impact on Fish Creek and the hundreds of thousands of folks who love it. Let me say a, a big shout out to, to Nick and his team. Nick came into my constituency office almost two years ago and told me about the great work that Fish Creek uh, uh, Park Society does uh, and really opened my eyes to how many nonprofit community-based groups didn't wait for the government. They stepped up through their own initiative on shoestring uh, budgets to do a lot of the heavy lifting to preserve, improve uh, our parks and um, to make them better for the folks who visit and enjoy them. And he said, he said to me, you know, you and the government of Alberta could get a lot more bang for the buck if you gave us just a little bit of a hand. We can take a small amount of funding and with our volunteer efforts, uh, we can really magnify the impact of, of that on the operation of these parks. Because uh, Jason's team at uh, Environment and Parks do great and important work, but we'll never have enough uh, conservation officers to do all that needs to be done 
in what is, I think, the largest uh, provincial park network in the country. And that's why we'll be more and more turning to creative partnerships like this um, with nonprofit groups, with volunteer organizations. And that's partly because here in Alberta, we believe that government is not the solution to everything. We believe in community. We believe in civil society. We believe in volunteerism. Uh, and that's what this announcement is about today. It's why it was Nick's idea that led to uh, our platform commitment to, quote, strengthen partnerships with, not, with nonprofit park societies like the Friends of Fish Creek Park and do so all across Alberta. So today, I'm happy to say, is another promise made and another promise kept. Nick and everyone who's here from the Society, congrats on decades of hard work. You've done a terrific job of maintaining Fish Creek, even as the city has grown around it. Alberta's government is looking forward to work with you uh, with, uh, to preserve this oasis of our economy as Alberta's economy recovers. Now, uh, Jason Nixon will be making announcements in the future about partnerships with other nonprofit groups uh, who uh, help to keep our backyard beautiful, sustainable, and accessible. Alberta's special outdoor spaces wouldn't be special without them. And while we're in tough times, there are always passionate people ready to give uh, their all for the causes that we all believe in. That's the Alberta way. It's true of parks, just as it's true when it comes to our economic recovery. Hard work, ingenuity, and generosity made our province what it is. As the relaunch picks up speed, uh, I've been seeing the same qualities all around Alberta amongst workers, families, businesses, and community groups. We've been in the worst public health crisis in more than a century, and now we are in a very deep fiscal hole. But we Albertans are a stubborn bunch, especially in the face of extreme challenges. And as history shows, we always overcome them. This time will be no different. We'll get through it together and emerge stronger on the other side. Thanks very much and looking forward to hear from, from Nick and, uh, and others about how they'll put the, this funding to great work. Hello, everyone. Um, that was um, quite an experience. I, I feel very humble uh, to be here after what has been a long 27 years for this society. Uh, I, I know some of the founding members, the people who are right at the beginning, uh, well-meaning community members who just wanted to help. I mean, this is a big park. It takes a lot of looking after. Um, so the original idea of the, of the Friends of Fish Creek was to actually to, to come into the park and help pick up some of the garbage. That's where it all started. Um, we fast forward 27 years to this moment. Um, this is, this is a great achievement for the society. I mean, on, on behalf of you know, our members and especially our volunteers and board and the staff, I would sincerely like to thank Premier Kenny, Minister Nixon and, and the team at uh, Alberta Parks for supporting our vision and believing in us and working with us to get to this moment where we can do more. And we do do a lot. We have 250 or so registered volunteers who together provide over 10,000 hours of volunteer work in this park annually. That's an incredible achievement. Uh, wonderful people from this community. Um, we spend a lot of time talking to our volunteers in our community because we need to know what, what drives people. Why do they keep coming back? Why do they want to be here pulling weeds, for instance, on a hot summer's day? And we learned how much this park means to each person at an individual level and as a, a family level, people come here for all sorts of different reasons. Reasons we would never have guessed in, 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 until we took the time to, to speak to them and ask. Uh, so this park provides an incredible canvas, if you like, for people's lives. People come here with their family or to exercise or to decompress or to learn or just to be outdoors for a few moments a day in, in, in a, a pleasant natural environment to be restored. There's so many different reasons and so many fascinating stories that we've been, we've been fortunate to, to be privy to. So the park provides a great service and there's this sort of symbiotic relationship because the community also provides an incredible service to the park in the hours that they put in to look after this park to make sure 
that it's going to be here for generations to come. So with the grant from AEP, we're in an incredible position now to be able to really leverage all the things that we've learned and all of our wonderful volunteers and all the opportunities we have, not just to do more of what we already do, do so excuse me, but also to work with our partners at Alberta Parks and, and, and explore some new ways that we can support the park and we can facilitate more and more opportunities for our volunteers to, to get involved and support the park they love and, and keep it here for future generations. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate the opportunity, Cheers. gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for that, Nick. We're also going to ask right now at this time for uh, Sarah Parker, who's the executive director of the Glenbow Ranch Park Foundation, another great partnership agency with Alberta Environment Parks, to come up and say a few words. I think you've been doing this longer than me because I need paper. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. On behalf of my team, I want to thank Premier Kenny and Minister Nixon and all of you for allowing us to be here today um, for part of this important announcement. Ten years ago, it's pretty crazy to think, but ten years ago, Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park began welcoming people from Alberta and around the world. And since that time, we have productively partnered with Alberta Parks to preserve, protect, and manage this incredible grassland asset. Our partnership is unique, and I really believe truly symbiotic. Together, we preserve, enhance, and protect Glenbow Ranch through ongoing communication, collaboration, support, and just everyday relationship building. Together, we've managed many successful capital projects in the park, like in 2017 when we enhanced and realigned some of our trail and our soon-to-be-completed, fully accessible um, pond viewing platform. We share a mutual commitment that Glumbo Ranch is preserved for future generations to enjoy. Our foundation is particularly proud because we take on the educational programming for the park. And every year we see roughly 5,000 children from the Calgary area. We give them hands-on engaging learning experiences, which I know they take home and tell their parents about over dinner, and I love hearing that. And we are always working towards strengthening this programming for the future. If you haven't spent time in grasslands, I will tell you they are a highly exposed area. And what that means is that weather can change on a dime. And that often leaves visitors exposed to weather that they just weren't prepared for. And uh, we've definitely rescued a few in storms and, uh, and hot days. So that's just one reason, Mr. Premier, that we are so excited that uh, you will be building us a four-season educational facility for the park. Beyond a haven during stormy weather, this new facility will enable young Albertans to learn more about this landscape, landscape and the human history. They will learn about Indigenous communities who understand and value grassland ecosystems, and they'll learn about wildlife, the habitat that surrounds them and con conservationism. Our goal is that each child who leaves our programming has a desire to protect Alberta's grasslands and other sensitive ecosystems. And uh, I hope eventually volunteer for us in the future. This new facility will also ensure enhanced programming for visitors of all ages through monthly park talks, special events, and providing a meeting space for our volunteers and other community organizations. I recognize and my team recognizes that right now is a very challenging time for all of us. And so we're very grateful for this investment in our new home. Uh, I want to thank Premier Kennedy and Minister Nixon. And I also want to give a huge shout out to the incredibly dedicated and hardworking Alberta Park staff. Um, we can't do what we do without them and I hope they can't do what they do without us. Together, I believe that we will strive to uphold Glenbow Ranch Provincial Park and its legacy for generations to come. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Sarah and Nick, for those remarks. Premier, thank you for your support uh, for this important announcement. Uh, and again, thank you to all of our partners across the entire province that work so hard with us to be able, with Alberta Environment and Parks, 
uh, to protect all of our landscapes, both in the provincial park system and the public land system, and to be able to make sure that Albertans can enjoy uh, their wild places now and for generations to come. And with that, uh, the, both the Premier and I would be happy to take some questions. Perfect. So before we jump to the phones, I see that there's a couple of folks here uh, who joined us at Fish Creek today. We do have a Unimic set up for you to ask your questions. We just ask that you please uh, maintain physical distancing during your questioning. That's too easy. <laughs> Hi, there's a question for Minister Nixon. Uh, Mark Villani with CTV News. Um, the funding, obviously good news today, but uh, it just begs the question, what's going to happen to all the parks the province is uh, planning to delist? I know uh, there was plans back in March uh, to fully or partially close 20 parks and reclassify 164 campgrounds and rec sites. Just wondering where we are with that update and uh, moving forward. So uh, delisting a provincial park from the provincial park system is not closing the park. Uh, the reality is... Uh, the, the majority of our special places inside this province are actually protected and managed through the Public Lands Division of Alberta Environment and Parks. Uh, and the smaller amount is actually managed through the park system. Uh, the conversation that's taking place across the province is for remote sites that are in the provincial park system. Uh, and having a conversation with communities on where there are opportunities to partner with agencies like we've spoken about uh, today, or looking at moving them to other parts of the Alberta Environment and Parks system uh, where we have staff closer to. Some of the facilities that you're, you're referring to in that number, uh, there's, it's a three hour round trip for provincial park officers to get there to manage that campground. And meanwhile, the whole area around it is protected underneath the public lands system and is managed by our public lands officers. And in some cases, it makes more sense for us to be able to use those officers to manage that system going forward. Alberta's government has committed to keeping these places accessible to Albertans, uh, but we are going to make sure that we're managing it in the most effective way so we can be able to utilize our resources across uh, all of this province. Thank you. Hi, my question is for the Premier. Uh, Premier Kenny, last week it was revealed that your government is considering cuts to H for next year. Um, You've been quite silent on that issue since last week when that information came about, but your Minister of Community and Social Services posted on Facebook that uh, she promised that H recipients would not see a cut to their benefits. Uh, are you willing to make the same guarantee? Well, it should be no surprise that uh, in the midst of the greatest fiscal crisis uh, since the province went bankrupt in, in the 1930s, that every department is looking at every possible way to achieve savings. And uh, the truth is that uh, we have by far the most generous benefits uh, for social services of any province in Canada. I think in, in the case of Asia, about 40% more generous than other provinces. So I'm not surprised that uh, that department has been looking at that. The minister has, has spoken to the issue. Uh, and I'll just refer you back to her statement, uh, which is that uh, she and her uh, team are looking at, at ways to deliver that program more efficiently. One thing we do have to look at very seriously is the fact that the number of people qualifying for Initially, AISH was a program designed for the severely handicapped, um, but the population of people qualifying has been growing uh, uh, far, far faster than the overall population, and so they have to look at issues like that. What are the uh, criteria? Um, how do we define severely uh, handicapped uh, in this day and age? So those are the kinds of issues that they're looking at. Are you willing to say any more to put, there's 70,000 people who rely on this program, are you willing to say more to put their minds at ease about whether they could be losing their benefits within the next year? Um, I, we, people, as, as long as they qualify, won't be losing benefits. Hey there, my question's for the Minister. Um, just more specifically, there were obviously the quiet uh, halting of the closure of 17 parks this summer, just so Albertans could enjoy the outdoors uh, while well, COVID's happening, so I wondered, uh, now that the summer's winding down, what's happening to those 17 parks specifically, and are you putting them back kind of on the chopping block? Well, again, those 17 facilities were not being close to Albertans. They uh, always have been intended to remain open for Albertans to access and utilize the same way that they do public recreation areas all across the province. Uh, during the COVID era, uh, we had to slow down the process of being able to transfer that from one division of the department to the other. At the end of the day, though, these facilities are not closing. They remain protected. They remain open to Albertans to be able to utilize, uh, but they're heading to other portions of the department where they can better manage uh, the resource on behalf of Albertans. And so in regards to those 17 facilities, the plan will continue uh, as now that we've come out of the, this extraordinary busy season that we've seen on public lands, and we'll work with the public land side of my department uh, to be able to take possession of those parks from the provincial park section, uh, and they will be uh, doing everything possible to make sure they're operating and available for Albertans next year. 
Thank you. Uh, this is for Premier Kenny. Uh, Mr. Premier, uh, Aaron O'Toole met with uh, Quebec's Premier uh, this week, said afterwards that the Canada East project... En I think you mean Energy East. Energy East, yes, sorry. Energy East program is off the table if he becomes Prime Minister. Thoughts? Well, actually, Bill, go back and check the transcript because that's not what uh, Aaron said. Uh, he said that, uh, first of all, he told the media that he had proactively raised with the Premier of Quebec the importance of Western Canada's energy sector, oil and gas, and getting Western Canadian oil to global markets. Uh, he was then asked, what about Energy East? He said, Energy East is off the table, and that's a matter of obvious historical fact, because in October 2017, the Trudeau government killed Energy East by imposing new regulations on TC Energy that pulled their application. Uh, but if you go and read Minister, Mr. O'Toole's uh, uh, comments, it's clear that he was there promoting pipelines. And let me say this about Aaron. He announced his uh, campaign for the Conservative leadership here in Calgary, uh, on, Cal on a Calgary radio station, uh, uh, promoting pipelines and our uh, oil industry. The very first issue that he raised with Prime Minister Trudeau after becoming leader of the opposition was Western alienation. And one of the very first issues he raised with the Premier of Quebec was the importance of getting pipelines built and Western Canadian oil uh, to global markets. So the fact that he just acknowledged that Energy East um, is no longer a, an, a, an active project is just a statement of fact. I wish uh, that were not the case. I wish Justin Trudeau's government had not imposed ridiculous new uh, regulations that caused TC Energy to walk away from the table. I wish we had had a provincial government in 2017 that would, would have stood up um, to the Trudeau government's uh, mandate that pipeline proponents have to take into account both up and downstream carbon emissions, but we didn't. And so it's true. Because of the Trudeau government, TC Energy took Energy East off the table. I, for one, and Alberta's government have not given up on the dream or a vision of a west-east pipeline system that takes Alberta oil to the port of St. John, to the Irving refinery, um, to displace Saudi oil imports. Uh, and that was one of the first issues I raised with Premier Legault when I first met with him. I will continue to do so. Um, speaking of which, allow, allow me to congratulate uh, my friend Premier Blaine Higgs on his re-election with the majority government mandate. Uh, last night in New Brunswick, uh, Premier Higgs is a former oil industry worker. He worked at Ir the Irving uh, oil refinery, uh, and he has been a passionate advocate of that uh, dream of connecting the country through energy independence with a West East pipeline. And just to follow up, uh, what can be done to uh, get a, a West East pipeline? Well, uh, what, what can be done is a, a, a private sector proponent coming back to the table with a, with a proposal, and let's be honest, that's not going to happen at um, $35 or $40 WTI at the current prices. But I uh, truly, truly believe there is a strong future for oil and gas in Alberta and in Canada. Uh, when global demand recovers post-COVID to something at or close to 100 million barrels a day, we are going to find very quickly a global supply crunch because there's been little or no investment in upstream exploration, uh, not just in North America, but across the world. When that happens, Alberta is set to succeed because we have one of the most efficient oil industries in the world. When we develop an oil sands project, it's there to produce for 30, 35 years, the same with thermal. And so we will demonstrate the, the efficiency of our sector, our availab our, our, the availability to provide that energy uh, as, as long as we get pipelines built. I think there are going to be strong prices um, 20, by 2022, post-recovery, because of that supply crunch. And perhaps in that context, we could see a private sector proponent come back to the table with a concept like Energy East. Right, perfect. We'll take our last question from the floor before going to the phones. Premier Kenny, you can just stay right there. Um, I, I would appreciate your thoughts. There was a recent poll done by Leger. It's a national poll where 25% of Canadians said that they feel that officials have overblown 
the COVID-19 pandemic, suggesting that Albertans are the most likely yeah. province to believe that. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, I, uh, th- th- I can see that very much as the case. I, you just have to check out my Facebook page. Uh, and I will say that um, what one of the things that's unique about uh, Alberta, and we, I think we, we see reflected in a lot of different polls, we have a very, very large number of Albertans who believe that um, the government, this government and governments generally have overreacted uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, on the other hand, we have a significant number of people who think we've underreacted. Yeah, I'll just give you an example. Yesterday, I, I posted what I thought was, well, it, what is factual information that I thought was modestly good news, that the number of Albertans in hospital with COVID-19 is down to 37 with only seven in intensive care. Uh, and that number keeps declining. I had the, the responses were either saying that I was trying to minimize the pandemic or that I was trying to stoke fear about the pandemic. Neither is true. The approach of Alberta's government has been uh, very deliberate. We have had the least stringent public health restrictions in Canada and the least stringent in North America with the exception of South Dakota. We have had less stringent public health restrictions than any country in Europe that I know of with the the one exception of Sweden. So we've taken the approach of trusting people uh, and their personal responsibility. And we've done well as a result through most of the last six months with the lowest level of infection, hospitalizations and COVID fatalities of the large Canadian provinces and lower than anywhere in the United States and I believe anywhere in Europe. So... I think Alberta is, its, is a model uh, of its own about how trusting people to be personally responsible has worked well. Not perfectly. There are lessons that we have to learn. Uh, at the height of the pandemic, 85% of Alberta's businesses uh, continued to operate within safe guidelines, representing 95% of our economy where in Ontario and Quebec, for example, they shut down the entire manufacturing and construction industries. They continued to, to uh, operate and create jobs in Alberta. So we have to, I, my, what I would say to those folks is first of all, um, COVID-19 is real. We, we can't wish it away. We can't uh, ignore it. And if we don't take reasonable precautions, uh, there's always the potential that it could lead to exponential growth and overwhelm our healthcare system. I would say to those who want us to shut everything down constantly, who didn't want to, to those who wanted us to close the schools uh, and to shut down more of the economy and, 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 and want to uh, basically government micromanagement of people's lives, I would say to those folks, um, look, the goal is not to eliminate the spread because that's effectively impossible. The goal is not to eliminate risk because we live in a world with risk. The goal is to manage the risk prudently. And I think we've done a pretty good job as a province in hitting that sweet spot. Thank you. Uh, Operator, uh, can you please put through the first caller? Our first question comes from Chris Barco, the Calgary Herald. Your line is open. Hi, Premier. Just to follow up on your comments about energy and energy demand, uh, yesterday BP uh, released its annual energy outlook report and said that even under its most conservative scenario, the pandemic is going to cut oil demand by about 3 million barrels a day by 2025. And two of their scenarios show oil peak, oil demand had rather has peaked already as in 2019. Does this give you any cause for concern? And what would it mean for Alberta's oil and gas sector and the need for pipelines going forward in your estimation? To the contrary, I don't think it's cause for concern. I think it's a confirmation of what we've always said, that there uh, will be a huge demand for oil and gas well into the future. Um, Chris, uh, you know, there are, there are some people who live in a fantasy land where they think that we can flick a switch uh, and somehow airplanes are going to be run, uh, operating on unicorn farts or something. Uh, and in the, But in the real world, we're going to be consuming hydrocarbon-based energy for a long time to come. That's what the BP projections confirm. I mean, the International Energy Agency, uh, their standard projection is for global de- consumption of crude oil at one at 110 million barrels per day in 2040. They're, uh, they've done a different scenario, which is their most bearish scenario. Fully, we're in a world that is fully compliant with Paris uh, a climate treaty. 
And in that scenario, they see about 75 million barrels per day, so off 25% of the pre-COVID uh, level. What BP is saying is like 97 million. So they're well within the range of where we've been in the last uh, decade or so. And, and so here's the point. For those people who want to, quote, leave it in the ground, including, let's face it, a bunch of people in Ottawa right now, um, they are operating in a fantasy world. Uh, here in Alberta, at least, we're operating in the real world. And we know that you cannot function a modern industrial economy uh, anytime now or in the foreseeable future without massive consumption of oil and gas. The challenge is how do we produce uh, that uh, oil and gas in, in a more environmentally responsible way. We've made massive progress on that. We will continue to do so. Uh, so I, I don't see the, the BP uh, forecast as a problem. To, to the contrary, I'm going to restate what I said earlier, Chris, which is that we know there will be a supply crunch once global demand recovers post-COVID. And we will be there because unlike U.S. shale, it's not churn and burn. We don't need to drill uh, a new well every year to replace uh, shale wells that are exhausted. We have projects that might be capital intensive up front, but they generate energy for 25, 30, 35 years. I believe for that reason, we have the most capital efficient oil and gas sector in the world, and that will become evident uh, post COVID recovery. All right, perfect. We uh, have time for a few more calls. So, uh, operator, can you please put through the next call? Our next question comes from James Keller of the Globe and Mail. Your line is open. Hi, this is a question for the Premier about the uh, public inquiry led by Steve Allen. Uh, Mr. Allen published some documents related to the inquiry this week, notably confirming that the process will not be looking at whether any of the environmental groups you're concerned about are spreading misinformation. He essentially says he does not have time to do that sort of fact-checking. So what do you think about that? What is the value of this inquiry if it's not even going to look at that sort of main allegation that there is a misinformation campaign? And is there an acknowledgement here that maybe this isn't as obvious as a problem as you claimed? Well, I haven't seen the letter, so I'll have to take a look at that. Um, and I haven't communicated with Commissioner Allen since the beginning of the process because he is independent. Um, the, uh, I know that he ha the Commission has had to spend uh, some of its time by what I would call a nuisance lawsuit uh, coming from those, some of those uh, foreign-funded special interests that want to, to avoid any kind of transparency or accountability for the lies that they've told about Alberta's responsible energy sector. Um, I, I just think they're, the very fact that they're trying to shut down that inquiry is, is perfect proof uh, that they do not want the, uh, the, transpar the transparency that the Commission is about. Uh, I've always believed that sunshine is the best disinfectant, and we need to get to the bottom uh, this, of the foreign-funded campaign to landlock Alberta energy. Uh, that's uh, why we committed to the commission uh, in the last election, uh, and that's uh, the, the mandate that's been given to the commission. Perfect. We have time for two more questions. Uh, operator, can you please put through the next caller? Our next question comes from Colleen Underwood of CPC. Your line is open. Hello, Premier. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, good. Okay. So uh, this has to do with another poll, a recent poll suggesting that you're tied with the NDP in support among Albertans if an election were called today. Just your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, uh, I'll remind you there were polls be just before the last Alberta election that supposedly had a neck-and-neck -neck finish when, in fact, uh, the United Conservative Party won that election by 23 points. So that's about how much credence I put in some of these polls. Secondly, we are focused on preserving lives and livelihoods, not polls and politics. Unfortunately, the NDP every day is trying to politicize this pandemic. Our focus is relentlessly on getting Albertans through one of the most challenging times in our history. Okay, perfect. Uh, operator, can you please put through the last caller? Our final question comes from Tom Brennan of Global News. Your line is open. Hi, Premier. Thanks for taking my question. Um, we've got the throne speech coming up uh, soon from Ottawa. A number of companies in Alberta looking at technologies related to hydrogen, um, lithium, stuff like that. First of all, what's your government planning to do to help those types of diversification projects? And what do you want to hear from Ottawa on that sort of stuff? Great question, Tom. Th those uh, industries and 
new technologies are very much part of Alberta's recovery plan uh, to diversify our economy and to leverage our strength in the energy industry to do so. Uh, we are developing a policy framework, for example, for the helium industry, a policy framework for uh, geothermal energy. A, a, a we're doing initial policy work on the concept of uh, uh, commercialization of blue hydrogen. Uh, we are making major investments uh, in technology to reduce the carbon intensity and environmental impact of our oil and gas sector through the Technology Innovation and Emissions Reduction Fund. And our appeal to Ottawa is to work with us on cutting-edge technologies like that, which help Canada become the world leader in environmentally responsible energy production. The answer has never been punishing people for heating their homes or driving to work. The answer certainly isn't policies that would shut down the largest sector of Canada's economy, oil and gas, that's responsible for 800,000 jobs in our economy and pays more taxes than any other sector. The answer is in innovation and technology. That's what we're doing as a provincial government. And we plead with Ottawa, if they're serious about uh, the environment and economic growth, don't work against us, work with us, work with the industry, work with us to uh, explore these exciting new technologies. And, and that's uh, exactly our, our message to Prime Minister Trudeau and his government. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you, guys.